<laughs> so, thanks for inviting me out. Hello. Where are we? We're in the Library of Congress, yeah. the nation's library, the world's largest library. But it's just one small piece of the guy. I walked all around the building here. And it's I, true. I was just in one building <laughs> and got lost. We have three buildings on Capitol Hill. Each one fills a city block. Wow. And so you're literally inside of the Madison Building, catty corner to the United States Capitol, yeah. in the shadow of the dome. But we're up on the third floor in a part of the library called the Prints and Photographs Division where we look out for 14 million pictures. Wow. And who are you? I'm Helena, Helena Zinkham, yeah. Acting Chief of the Prints and Photographs Division. Very cool. So give me some sense of 14 million pho photographs and prints and engravings, I guess you have Yeah, here. engravings, posters, cartoons, architectural drawings, any kind of way that people have represented the world through visual materials. So what's so. the oldest artifact you have here that you know of? Yeah, in the 1400s, those would be some of the early engravings from Europe. And what's the newest one you have here? We have some photographs made this year by contemporary photographers who were documenting uh, Iraqi war veterans. Very cool. And their life after they've come back to the United States. And the whole purpose for libraries, which yeah. isn't to be dead warehouses of stuff, <laughs> um, but to preserve the knowledge so that people can use it and get it out beyond our walls. Now, one thing We're I all about information and then other people gathering ideas and making them into books or movies or family histories, whatever. Yeah. One thing I didn't understand, and so the public's not allowed in your offices, obviously. No, but we have a reading room. Yeah, right down the hall. Right? Absolutely. And yeah. what can people see there? And how much of, out of the 14 million photos, how, what can they see there? People can ask for any of the pictures that we have. Okay. We don't, I'm about to show you some glass negatives, yep. and that's special. You're going to look on behalf of America, <laughs> okay. because we really don't bring the glass. It's too fragile. Yep. But what we do is have prints, or we'll have digital online copies that people can look at. Okay. But if we had a photographic print, a poster, a cartoon drawing, anything that's not too fragile, we'll bring that out to the reading room and people can look at the originals. Yeah, you have millions of, of photos on film that has to be kept in super cold temperatures. Exactly. Right? And that's uh, not in the reading room, right? No. Yeah. No, those are in off-site storage. Uh, photographs are highly chemical. Yeah. They're made up of dyes and plastics and emulsions and silver bits. Uh, so the colder we keep them, that slows down the chemical reactions, they'll last longer. What we're here to talk about, you've, you, your team is moving a lot of the work onto Flickr, right? Oh. Yes, we, um, we're always looking for new ways to help people learn about our collections. Yeah. So in, you'll discover I'm pretty history-minded at times. Yeah. Okay. So libraries, we gather in all parts of the past and the present, and then we keep trying to use new technology to make it more accessible, useful, and available. So around 1900, we were right in there adopting typewriters. We got to the 1950s, and I was reading some of our old annual reports. There was this new thing in town called TV, and the staff were incredibly excited. <laughs> we got out our Civil War photographs. The cameras came and apparently panned in close and magnified. It was great. So just about a year ago, an idea came about trying to use Web 2.0 as a new technology. Yeah. So we've had pictures on the Internet, more than a million, for uh, more than a decade. But the reality is most people don't even know that photographs are in libraries, yeah. right? You think about books. Yeah. What else do you think about? Maybe videos, movies sometimes. There you Maybe go. music if, if you're in a cool library, right? <laughs> you're in a very cool library. We got tons of music. <laughs> um, magazines, newspapers. Yeah. But would you have thought of photographs? Not necessarily, no. No, and probably not. Unless I was thinking of Vance Adams' books or something like that. No, yeah. but we have the originals, the real deal. What was inside the camera, what the photographers created to print and show people. We have the first portrait photograph that has survived in America. How old is that? Uh, 1839. Oh. So Daguerre events the whole process and releases it to the world in the fall of 1839. And just about two months later, uh, Robert Cornelius in Philadelphia picked up the recipe from a newspaper, <laughs> mixes himself a batch of the chemicals, the mercury, the silver on the copper plate, the whole thing. He made a picture of himself 
That's, it's an incredibly cool photograph. You need to remember to let, get me to show you it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's a treasure of American photography here at the Library of Congress. Right. But we also have, from the Great Depression, a migrant mother. Uh, we have from World War II, Ansel Adams' work at the Manzanar camp, yeah. where the Japanese were um, interned. Uh, Civil War photography, I think I already said, and acres of photojournalism pictures. Yeah. So whether it's... Yeah, behind the cameras, yeah. uh, look magazines up on the wall, right? That's right, and that's five million pictures right there. But we also, so it's about pictures as basic information, what did somebody look like? Yeah. Just bread and butter, <laughs> as well as incredibly important artifacts of culture or science, invention, like the first daguerreotype portrait in America. Cool. Also incredibly beautiful pictures. I mean, you just kind of fall in love with them when you look at them. Which, if you were to pull three, three, well, you pulled three photos pulled out of your some. stack. <laughs> what, what would be some of your favorite ones, favorite, favorite photos in the collection? Well, I genuinely do like that first portrait. It's magically uh, vivid about his life. He's peering with complete curiosity into the lens of a camera at a plate he made himself. You could just look at it forever. But then there are very everyday pictures on the surface of them. I think of them as the look twice pictures. Yeah. You kind of look and enjoy. Oh, that's funny, that's pretty. And then something draws your attention and you look again and you just walk right back into time. They invite you right inside to wonder. Who were those people? What were they doing? Why was the picture made? It's great. Absolute inspiration. Yeah. So I'm very lucky in my job. How is digital changing your world? I mean, and we'll talk about how you're getting some of these photos into the digital world, but you know, yeah. lots of my friends have these Canon 5Ds and, and Nikon D3s, and we're running around the world taking, making images that don't exist on film or paper yeah. anymore. They exist on a hard drive in yeah. some data center at Flickr, <laughs> probably. So is that making your job much more difficult or easier or, or uh. different? or? You know, it, Do you it, think a hundred years from now you're going to be storing? Like, oh, like absolutely. We talked about having a data center here at the absolutely. library. Absolutely, but you know, caring for film photographs is so difficult yeah. that I feel I think the library is absolutely up to the challenge of the born digital. So today, for example, a photographer, Carol Highsmith, mm -hmm. she travels the country, and she ships us her hard drives, and we load them onto servers and put them in our online catalog. She's an amazingly energetic person, just come back from the Democratic and I think also the Republican convention. Yeah. I haven't, we, she hasn't shipped us those pictures yet, but we try to keep up with her. Uh, we'll get several thousand new scenes each year, and it's meant to be a taste of life of America, whether she's traveling to a national park or a small town. She literally travels the whole country. So we try to keep up with what's happening today. Another photographer, Joe McNally, he documented for the centennial of flight. Yeah. He was able to go up in some supersonic airplanes. Um, and I saw so some of his photos. He had, he had really interesting photos of the aircraft, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, some were in National Geographic and elsewhere. But he, um, we have 7,000, so it's a very rich body of documentation. Yeah. And we took that collection as a sample it's wonderful in its own right, but it's also meant to be a sample for, or the counterpart, I should call it. We have the first photograph of people flying in the United States because the Wright Brothers papers are here at the library. Yep. So we have the glass negative that was on the sands in Kitty Hawk. And as the plane came towards the camera, uh, they had an assistant who captured that moment of the first powered man flight. So we wanted to step back a hundred years later, and I guess that would be called step ahead, and see what flight was like a hundred years later. Yeah. From that barely off the ground, but it counted, to zoom through the air. Do you so. work with the other museums? Because I've been to the Air and Space Museum. Oh, absolutely. That's why when I say we only have a sample, you know, we're not thoroughly documenting space and flight today because there's an entire museum devoted to it. Yeah. Terrific photo collection Do you up there. share your photos with the other ma museums and lend them out or so Oh, that, absolutely. Because I've been to the Kitty Hawk uh, exhibit at the Air and Space Museum and I bet some of your photos 
or at least reproduce there, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We share through reproductions, we share through lending originals, but we also keep in touch with each other. So if one place is going to go deep into a certain topic, yeah. then they'll cover that for us and we'll have a counterpart. Uh, so we, we work cooperatively. So how, how do you get these images into the computer then? Uh, a know, camera. A, just we rephotograph them. What kind of, give me an example. It's a like Sinar. Is that what you mean by yeah, yeah. giving say okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh Yeah, it's a Sinar camera. Uh, we're going to go take a look at it in a little bit. Okay. So imagine a room about as large as this space, camera, lights on each side, black curtains all around, so we're controlling the light as best we can. Yeah, so you don't get reflections or glare. Exactly. Um, it's a very automated system with gifted contractors. Um, I'd like to compliment them because they're often they're often scanning negatives yeah. and as you'll see in a moment that means reversed uh, but also the polarity lights are dark darks are light yeah. and yet they're able to capture it fairly quickly and then they look at it on a computer screen and a bit like you were printing in a dark room yeah. they just enough adjust it you know not like art printing but yeah. just enough adjust it for clarity legibility um, do they try to Detail. do any, uh, like if there's a rip in the photo nope. or anything? They Absolutely don't, not. They don't do any fixing or anything? Yeah, I know that we do frustrate people at times who want to put the pictures directly in a book, but our role is to represent the artifact as best we can. Yeah. We want to show it as an authentic object. And we then leave the work of fixing adjusting to fit the particular needs of a book or a newspaper or other reproduction wall poster each person who further uses the picture needs to do it. It was one of the comments that came up on Flickr yeah. they asked my goodness why didn't you bump the color and sharpen the tones and the rest well no we we try to be the neutral representer yeah. because each person will have a different idea about how well, to print it, how to optimize it so how to repurpose. So you try to match the what's on online to actually what's as in front best of we you. can. Um, do you? So you put out uh, probably JPEG compressed images, right? No, we actually use TIFF uncompressed. Uncompressed, okay. And then from that, we'll make derivative JPEG for easy viewing and the thumbnail GIF for quick display in the index. It's interesting. Photographers are different. Some photographers would like to control what they give us, and yeah. they'll give us the TIFF or JPEG that they made so that we have the picture the way they want it to be. Yeah. That's fine. That's their choice. Our agreement. We'll take the picture the way you meant it to appear. Kind of like Ansel Abbs would make yeah. a print. The negatives that he gave to the Library of Congress were just that set, his documentation of Manzanar. Mm -hmm. And he gave it to us though with a very specific, in his letter, he gave them to us around 1960. And his note says, please take care of them, but please also make sure that lots of other people use them and see them. Yeah. He wanted it wide open, yes. A photographer's a gift is not just about what you capture with the camera, okay. but then how you work with that raw material to present it to the world. Yeah. And what we worry about as a library is that if we got into the specialized optimizing printing business, that's very subjective. And we would, well, we've decided we do better to represent keep coming back to that word artifact don't I but yeah. the object as best we can within the limits of digital technology and then let other people be their own Ansel Adams right yeah. we scan we scan when we can at 3000 on the long side yeah. pixels and there are times when we'll go higher uh, with glass negatives now, not what we have on Flickr, but the projects we're starting today will go to 16-bit depth. Okay. So we've been at 8-bit depth for more than 10 years, but it's finally time that we'll go to 16-bit. Uh, you can imagine the amount of greater tonality. These, yeah. the f even on a computer screen, the photographs have a glow to them that it's just great to be able to see. Yeah. Are you working on uh, capturing any of the photographers' thoughts about making the images? Since many of these photographers are still alive, or, um, or like I, I interviewed Ansel Adams' son, and he had lots of uh, 
stories yeah. about how the photos were made and where they were made and what experiences he had with his, because he was there when the photos were being made, but he's pretty old. He's not going to be around for too many more years, so some mm -hmm. of those stories are going to disappear. Mm -hmm. I know I, I just visited the museum and they have the Pulitzer Prize photography exactly. room. Exactly. Isn't it and great? They, it's awesome because they have all the photos there, but they also, but they have, also have people talking. have videos of the photographer talking and that, right. that really adds a different experience to the photo to understand what that person saw and was experiencing yeah. when they made the image. We haven't done a great deal of it mm -hmm. with uh, one collection. Of in s let's see, whenever we can gather biographical information about the photographers, we want to have it we put it online. By the time the George Bain photographs came to us, the news photos from 1910 to 20, not only was he long gone, but many of the people who worked around him. Um, but one of his relatives very recently did get in touch with us, and so you bet we are working hard to gather whatever family history and more we can. But as an example of what we have, um, that's Dorothea Lang. Yeah, Lange, right? the mi migrant mother, Dorothea Lang. Lang. We have not only the notes that Dorothea Lang made at the time the photo was taken and sent in to Roy Stryker. We have what she said 10, 20 years later. And even best, we also have what Florence Thompson, the migrant mother, said about it. And I think that's my absolute favorite. When we have not only what the photographer was trying to accomplish, but if they were showing people or towns the chance to hear from the subjects of the photographs. And the different points of view can be amazing. Yeah. So one of our uh, great reference librarians, she wrote up both sides of the story and they're up on our website. For, for, this, for this mother? For Migrant Mother. So we can look that up, yep. Migrant Mother, you bet. and we'll find that? Yes. Now you're wearing gloves. Did, oh yeah. <laughs> should I always wear gloves when handling photos or just yes. for certain kinds of photos? <laughs> no. Actually if you came into our reading room as a researcher, yeah. we would welcome you. And then if you were going to handle fine prints or photographs that didn't have a large mount on them on the sides, we would ask you to put on some gloves. Either the white cotton, which is what I brought you today, but I'm going to get ready to flip a glass negative for you so I have on the thinner latex. Yeah. Um, if a lot of people want to come to Washington D.C. and see, you know, all the sites and Library mm -hmm. of Congress should be one of the stops. What are if they have an hour here just to see your collection? What what are a few things that they should look for inside the uh, reading room yeah. or out yeah. down in, down in if the you uh, room? If you had if you had one hour in the whole Library of Congress, yeah. what most people really enjoy is going to the oldest building. Yeah. It's named for Thomas Jefferson. And just standing in, we call it the Great Hall, um, and looking down on the main reading room at other people doing research, or visiting, you, you get to soak up a sense of how amazing the kinds of information and the potential for knowledge that is here at the library. And you also get to look at one or two of the exhibits, which is the quickest way to see a variety of photographs, prints, books, movies, sound recordings, newspapers. Yeah. So the fastest way to cut across the breadth of the collections is actually to go and see the exhibits. Today it's called Creating the United States. Yeah. We're going to uh, go look, look at that as we well. Are. We Excellent. are. Excellent. That's going to be fun. If you had one hour in our reading room, then I would, in other words, you really just wanted to come to the mecca of photography or something, yeah. then we'd invite you in. And I'd probably turn you loose on the Farm Security Administration collection okay. uh, and let you browse through the files in the reading room. We'll go take a look at that later, too, if you like. Yep. Or um, tour the world through a kind of photograph called stereograph. Ooh. So you can see in three dimensions. Um, and those two collections are stored in our reading room. This used to be really popular in the early 1900s. Oh yeah, and millions and millions were made. Yeah, I, I, in uh, San Francisco mm -hmm. around the 06 earthquake, they oh. had stereographs of what the earthquake looked we like. We have some here. Yeah. yeah. That'll be fun to go look at. All right, let's do that. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you're most uh, welcome. This is a lot of fun. Actually, I'm going to... We should talk about Flickr. Yeah, Flickr and uh, talk about... Look at these actual pictures. Yeah, yeah, let me get behind the camera and then... We thought about trying to build a Web 2.0 site here at the Library of Congress. You could laugh now if you'd like or no, something. No. <laughs> <laughs> because as, of course, we got deeper into it, we realized the whole point of Web 2.0 is wonderful communities that already exist. Yeah. And instead of trying to bring people to the library, we should go out and participate.
Yeah. And that's exactly what Flickr offered us. An existing photo friendly, photo loving community. Yeah. And then the question was, would they be open to old pictures? Yeah. And it turns out they were. How many, how many visits have you had to the Flickr site, oh, do you know? Right. Um, very close to nine and a half million views of the collections. Wow. I don't think I really know separate visits. Yeah. But about 15,000 different Flickr members have asked us to be a contact. So they're interested enough in the old pictures to have our new loads enter their um, yeah. account page. We've had many thousands, uh, sorry, something like 70 to 80 percent of the photos have been favorited. Yeah. And then some of them have been favorited a gajillion times. But of the 4,000 we've put out so far, I think it's been a pretty good um, level of interest. Yep. The best part in some ways are the comments. I'm, I'm delighted people are viewing that. That who's was the whole point, being who's aware. Uh, whose idea was it to put that on there? Was it a, a team decision, or did, was did uh, team James did Billington come in your office oh. and say, yeah, yeah, it's time to go on Flickr? Because <laughs> <laughs> I know he's pretty progressive. <laughs> he is, actually. Yeah, I met him at Google one time. <laughs> he's the um, guy who runs this place, right? So he is. He's the the librarian, librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington. Yeah. Um, he is our, yeah, he is actually all about the future and making sure that the present uses the past to build a better future. Now we have a more formal statement of our mission, um, but we're to acquire, preserve, make available, make useful, not just keep locked inside our walls. So tell me about that original meeting where, where you guys decided to use Flickr. Well, Michelle had gone to a session of computers and libraries and heard a presentation from the guys who run Picture Australia, yeah. and they were very positive about Flickr. And so we went out and looked at a variety of different photo sharing websites, but it really was Flickr that was the best fit because that's the site most focused on images themselves and talking about what you see in pictures, how they're made, technical properties, but a sheer enjoyment of pictures. I think the Flickr mission says it well. Share your photos, watch the world. Yeah. So we could be a part of the world that was watched. So these are some photos that I can see on fo on Flickr? Absolutely. And these are the originals? Well, some well, of these no, are actually sorry. prints of the scans. This is the original. Yeah. It's a glass negative. And I'm going to go ahead and try to hold it up for you a little bit. Can you? Yeah. It's five by seven inches. A photograph made around 1910. It's maybe an eighth of an inch, inch thick, this sheet of glass. Yeah. They scratched the name Schaefer Washington. And frankly, for many of these news photographs, we didn't know much more than that. Wow. They might say Chicago Dell, meaning delegates. And that turned out to mean the 1912 Chicago Political Presidential Convention. So once we, we had a meeting, we decided on Flickr around May of 2007. Yeah. Then we called Flickr up and worked with George Oates, who was amazingly receptive. Actually, all you have to do is look at some of these pictures and you fall in love with them. And um, So we, we knew we had a good fit. Yeah. And worked that summer, uh, just about a year ago, uh, to put together a special kind of account because although we went into this very much wanting to be a member of a Web 2.0 community, we we're not asking the world to change for us. Yeah. So we, we would participate on equal terms. Yeah. But the fact is that Flickr was built for people who created the photos to load the photos. Yeah. It was built on a business model of individual people and we're a whole group of people. So Flickr did make one change for us, and then as George began to think more and more, she said, you know, we need a new tool or a new forum. And she called it the Commons. And now, not just the Library of Congress, but um, the Smithsonian, the George Eastman House, uh, a Lisbon Art History Collection, the Toulouse Public Library, yeah. the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, 
apologize if I've forgotten one or two names, but you can see it on the Flickr Commons yeah. that there are an assembly of now eight amazing photographic collections represented. So again, we wanted to participate, regular style account, comments, notes, the whole nine yards, tags. But in the end, we are stewards of collections, not creators. Yeah. And so they also built a new right status called no known copyright restrictions. In other words, we observe a status. We don't. Um, we are freely offering these pictures for other people to look at, yeah. to uh, work with, to make new pictures from, to enjoy however oh, really? you would choose. So there are, uh, is that considered public domain, or is that very close to? Yeah. We can't warrant it as public domain. Okay. But we've done analysis where the risk is as low as possible. Yeah. The Bain News Service started around 1905, and they were the first news photography agency in the United States. And Mr. Bain, George Grantham was his name. He's based in New York City. Now, do you know who we're looking at in this image? This is a baseball player. Yeah. And let me switch out. Um, what the picture looks like is here. Does that show on your camera yep. okay? Yep. Yeah. This picture of Germany Schaefer, it's one of 40,000 glass negatives in the George Grantham Bain collection. Wow. And we picked uh, a piece, a moment of time in the Bain collection, like negative 2,000. And we loaded 1,500 to start with, and then we add 50 more each week. Wow. And it's whatever was in the news. They're, they're broadly filed chronologically. A couple of weird pictures turn up from time to time in the sense of, hey, what happened? We were doing the Olympics in 1912, the presidential elections in 1912, and I'm sure this is World War I. So occasionally things are a little out of order in Bain's filing system. But we're trying to show the raw history. Yeah. Just let it be what it is. So whoever was a newsmaker or noteworthy in their day, if that negative survived unbroken all the way to 1948 when it came to the Library of Congress, we've scanned all 40,000. The full collection is up on the library's website. Okay. So if someone got seriously interested in Bain, they hop over here, explore. Yeah. But from the Flickr perspective, we add these 50 new each week. And our call was, can you help us identify? And ha has that happened at all? Oh, tremendously. Every single day. <laughs> it's great. And sometimes not just one person identifying, but a whole conversation. Yeah. People will know different things. So uh, Germany Schaefer is actually a picture that we researched because he represented to us such a wonderful, a baseball player who's a catcher. Yeah. But he borrowed the photographer's camera for an opening day of the Washington Senators playing the Yankees yeah. up at, um, in New York City. And he, he was a sideline comedian. You can kind of tell from the expression on his face. So we did about five hours of research to learn everything we could about this photograph. Yeah. So we know tons more could be told about each of these. But for the 50 that we load each week, it could be a naval boat, um, a dirigible or airship next to a movie star, a book author, um, now boxers. Do people ever, because on Flickr you can put photos into the comments, do people ever say, yes. I have a sister photo to that or yes. I have a photo in that series or something? That, and do people do that? Yeah. Tell me some stories. Okay. I'm going to switch out to one, uh, a view of New York City where there was an Olympic parade coming down um, Broadway, I think. Yeah, because yeah. that sounds right. So people began to debate what part of New York City it was. And one person went ahead and read the store signs and wrote in to say, based on the store signs, it's probably Broadway. And then someone looked at the cross streets. Um, but in the end, a person sent in a photograph from the New York Public Library that showed the same intersection and had a complete caption with it. So there was visual verification of the site. And then someone got interested in the uh, streetcar, yeah. which had been called a cable car or something. And anyway, said, no, no, look at the rails. I mean, tiny little detail. 
and went into some of the transit history of New York City. So they brought that whole picture alive as a slice of time of New York. Yeah. They knew the names of all the people, the Olympic athletes who were in the cars being celebrated. Uh, anyway, it was great. Do you ever do a display where you show a moment in time captured by 50 different photograph photographers? Because, like, I shot Ronald Reagan when he visited Silicon Valley, and I, I, there were so many photographers. Yeah. Not only, there was 40,000 people in the audience, a lot of people were taking pictures from the audience perspective, but the Mercury News had three or four photo photographers, yeah. and the AP had photographers, and I was up there. And, and we all captured different slices of the same moment in time. Mm -hmm. Do you ever try to re-piece together a moment in time like that captured by, by different cameras? The closest we've come is September 11th. Yeah. Uh, we, we do sometimes, well, we have things like Lincoln's inauguration where we might have four or five photographs occasionally by different people. When you get into the 20th century, that's when we tend to have multiple people documenting the same event because you want a variety of perspectives. Yeah. One person's eye is fragmentary. Um, so having multiple viewpoints is always healthy. On the other hand, there's limited resources and time for a library. But when it came to something like World War II, September 11th, the Great Depression, we definitely have many different photographers representing. Yeah, I'm just thinking I'm playing with this new technology from Microsoft called Photosynth, which lets me take uh, something like 50 to 300 images of like a room like this, and I can mm. stitch them together oh, into right, a right, and make it, yeah. And I'm wondering if uh, you, you're starting to think about how do you do yeah. that with the photography that's yeah. coming into the collection. I've done some experimenting with Microsoft on that. Actually, um, one of the things they did several months ago, actually, was they came into the main reading room, sort of as a, a <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm Matt Raymond, Director of Communications at the library. Yeah, and you said there that you're doing some uh, experimentation with Microsoft and other technologies to do these panoramic or stitch together experiences, I guess, is the right way. Yeah, we have a, a technology partnership with Microsoft for what we call the Library of Congress Experience. Helena uh, uh, alluded to some of the new exhibits that we have, and they incorporate a lot of uh, state-of-the-art Microsoft technologies to allow people to interact with uh, collections in ways that they haven't been to before. And uh, several months ago, actually, when Photosynth was, synth was still in the in the development stage, um, they came and, and we just had a couple staffers who went around the main reading room of the library taking photos on a variety of cameras, even something as simple as a cell phone camera as a proof of concept, and were able to stitch it together into uh, a very early Photosynth. So the main reading room was probably one of the first I think architectural spaces that was ever uh, rendered using photos. So, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. And I need to get my glove on my right side here. <laughs> this is called Blind, uh, sorry, Weavers at Work. Yeah. And I'm going to bring this one up on Flickr so that you can see how sort of between the, the glass and then the digital presentation. Yeah. So as people began to converse about this scene, some pretty wonderful things happened. Uh, first of all, people were just intrigued by weavers at work. Well, there was another caption on we're this photograph. Right now, oh, right? true enough, yes. But that says, weavers at work. Yeah. Here it says, the New York Blind Association. And so one of the first benefits of putting the negative up on Flickr let's see, is that many different eyes were able to see the digital scan and look closely. Yep. We had had the resources and invested in scanning all 40,000 of these glass plates. Yeah. But the only words we had associated were the very few that Bain himself or his staff weavers at work. Nobody had gone in and had time to pull out the whole plate and look closely. All right, here's where it gets more exciting. So from Weavers at Work to New York Blind Association. Yep. Ah, these are blind women weaving. Right. All kinds of questions come up. Where? Why? For what purpose? A Flickr member wrote in and noticed the small photographer's logo in the corner yep. and said not only is that Byron of New York, very well-known commercial photographer in his day, it was her great-great-grandfather. 
Oh, wow. And so she began to put in some links that would tell us more about the photographer whose work that Bain had published. People speculated about the kind of weaving. They examined the looms, the clothes the women were wearing, the general setting and room, and eventually concluded they're weaving rugs. And you'll see that more easily in the background. Yeah. Many months later, another person wrote and said, but how about that device in the corner? And they thought it was a special kind of musical, you know how they're player pianos? Yeah, but this it looks is sort of a, like an organ, doesn't it? Well, it does, with the pipes up. Yeah. And it's a player piano for a whole, like a whole concert. Lots of different uh, notes and tunes, way beyond a piano. Yeah. And sent in a link to Wikipedia where there was a drawing of such a thing and is hoping that a Flickr member will write in and confirm uh, the type of musical instrument. Wow. So the, the pictures come alive for people and looking at all different aspects and factors. And I'd just like to go to the computer sure. and show you. So we picked two collections. One, yeah. the color transparencies from the Great Depression and World War II. We're pretty sure that would surprise people in a happy way yeah. because most don't think of color in World War II. Yeah. And the chance to see your own life if you're in your 80s, yeah. but how life was as a child or the stories that your parents and grandparents told you about. Um, to see that so vividly has meant a lot. And that's reflected in wonderful comments of appreciation, but also comments of uh, memory and stories we told. My dad talked about building ships. My mother told me about working in a factory that I'd never seen a picture before. Yeah. Other people wrote in to tell us about history that we'd heard of Rosie the Riveter, but no one had ever said to them that African American women had participated as well. We hadn't been in the textbooks. So we have symbols and icons, that's great. But the photographs were giving them information that they didn't know from written stories and written records. So it's a very really important language and important capturing of the past. Not just approachable, but sometimes information that you wouldn't get otherwise. Also with the color photos from World War II, um, people are looking so wonderfully closely, they'll occasionally write in to say, you know, that isn't a P-51 plane, it's this other kind. So it's great to be able to improve and update the information. Lots of people are tagging the pictures by what's meaningful to them, also wonderful. So we might tend to index World War II, parachuting, flight training. Uh, this is a picture where uh, almost 70 more tags were added to get at the color predominant, white, the number of people in the picture, seven, the billowing aspect of the parachute, the fact that it's made of silk, anything that resonates about that picture that might help you find it again, or the freedom to s tag with whatever you would help you remember to come back to the picture. Those have been great aspects. The second collection is the news photographs from around 1910 mm -hmm. to 1920, the Bain collection. Go ahead and sign in. Yeah. We have almost no information about them. How did you uh, acquire that collection? Do you, do you know where that came from? It came as a gift from a company in New York City that inher had inherited it. As you could imagine, 40,000 pieces of glass take up a fair amount of space, yeah. and the company wanted to move, didn't want to take the glass with them, and they gave it to the Library of Congress in 1948. We were delighted to have it. Well, I'm going to search for a Flickr member called the Library of Congress. And when I go to the library's photo stream, I'm shown the two collections, the color photography we've spoken about, There are 1,600. Yeah, it's coming. And I just wanted to quick scroll through for folks to be able to see or invite you to come and visit yourself. Yeah. Probably be more meaningful. And these are all from the 40s? Yeah, uh, some were taken in 1939, but basically the early 1940s. Now, are these from around just the United States, or are these the wor world, or? Just the United States. Yeah. And 
including though Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. Um, so there are some pictures of what were at the time territories, yeah. now United States, but it's meant to be a home portrait. And it begins showing things that had happened during the Great Depression, um, but soon moves into, so showing the rural south, for example, uh, er, land erosion. That's the... Yeah. The slideshow is a wonderful way to enjoy looking at them. Cool. So, so people see a picture like this and they might say, uh, Huck Finn, yeah. memory of Tom Sawyer. Or they'll write to us about they still live in that town and what it looks like today. A, a wonderful ranging variety. Pictures inspiring memory of the past, but then also sharing some understanding with other people. Yeah. We've also enjoyed that folks will write in with, uh, they seem to appreciate the technical properties, the quality of the composition. I want to go back. I've probably gone too far back, haven't I? There we yeah, go. That's cool. All right. The Library of Congress computers are heavily used and our response time slow a bit occasionally. It's no different at home. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, but of course you can also search. Yeah. And I'm going to try w one of our favorites, which is a, a house in Houston. Again, to give you a taste of the kinds of amazing comments people have provided. Uh, in this case, a photograph that has uh, almost 200 favorites and uh, more than 20 comments. Very gifted photographer here. His name is John Vashon. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. And he's, no, please, I'd love to hear what you think of the photos, too. <laughs> I'm just trying to capture them in B-roll <laughs> so that Rocket can use them. Okay. These will be edited in later. So what, what's this photo? It's a house in Houston that has now been matched to the Google map that shows the current location. Wow. Debate about whether the house is still standing or not. The groups so far, houses with towers, uh, the gingerbread house people have been interested. But someone read the street address. Does that say 1900 Franklin written on the side of a curb? Right. So the Library of Congress went into this knowing House, Houston, Texas, 1943 May, photographer. I think we gave it some pretty good subject headings, houses, carts and wagons, World War II, and the location. But other people, with that extra boost of resource and participation, look at that, cart, Pepsi, oh, laundry, clothesline, Queen Anne house, veranda, gingerbread. Uh, merchant, baskets, valley fruit. I mean, it's amazing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lots of tags. And then the comments. Fantastic place, beautiful detail. I love the double wraparound porches. Um, memories of air conditioning and what it was like not to have air conditioning. <laughs> but then they start to get in, is it really the 1900 block of Franklin? In here, they'll match it up to the Google map to prove it. Um, and then old Pepsi logos versus Coca-Cola. There's the Google map link. But in the end, a sort of a basic, I love it. I may not know why, but I do. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Not everything needs to be explained. <laughs> I'd like to do one more search for you. Sure. I told you about the weavers at work. Oh, well, there's just so many hundreds of pictures we could show you. Yeah. Uh, someone tagged the air balloon as a dirigible, which then made some people angry because a dirigible is a fixed frame airship. This is just an inflated balloon. But it's still a beautiful picture. Oh, right, that's not the issue. 
<laughs> Please take away the dirigible tag. <laughs> well, we're actually approaching this, uh, you know, again, Web 2.0 spirit, really hands off. Yep. And in a weird way, by the time they finish the discussion, what's a dirigible, what's a balloon, it becomes a very informative picture to turn to if you wanted to know the difference between them. Yep. And in a weird way, it becomes about a dirigible, even though it doesn't show you one. Yep. So it's just been something to see. We've loaded the 4,000 pictures, the color photos, a lot of memory and history. For the Bain, we knew so little information about the negatives going in that we're getting uh, basic good additions that we then fold back into our home catalog. Yep. So it's been a tremendous help. For many years, people have come into the Library of Congress and volunteered here in our reading room. Yep. We have about 10 volunteers at the moment. So it's, the library's always depended on help from others. And pictures, I think, in particular. Yep. Uh, you know, how much information do you write on your own pictures? Not much. Not that much. <laughs> but I bet the time will come when we do need to take all this caption and we'll put it into the headers of the digital files. So things walk around together yep. more. So with the Bain, because all we knew was weavers at work, and yeah. then people wrote in to tell us the name of the photographer as well as Bain the publisher, and so we Can have. Can you show me that image again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me, uh, this is the my white balance there, you know? uh, weavers at work. Yeah. So we actually, as I'm just going to scroll down and show you how the conversation developed. Yeah. This is my great grandfather Percy Byron. Here's where more of his collection is available. We say thank you. And in fact, I went ahead and added a direct link into the part of the Museum of City of New York collection where not only more Byron photos are, but the fact that there's 200 more just of the New York Blind Association. Wow. So and if you, you wanted no to see. this existed before this? No. We were, very, we were competent and could have looked it up. But with 40,000 negatives, yeah. we hadn't had the resources to get started. I hope it comes across for people. We love this stuff. We would love to be able to caption it. But there are 14 million pictures, just about 40 people on the staff here, and we need to prioritize to what we can do that nobody else could do. Yeah. So that would be the initial scanning. We have very gifted catalogers here. Yeah. and they can describe thousands of pictures every year. But when you have tens of thousands and millions, that chance for expert volunteers or people willing to help us look things up is terrific. So you have, in this case, a descendant of the photographer helping, but you also have people who understand weaving helping yeah. and people interested in music. Cool. Thank you very much. You're most welcome.